Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's lovely to see you here again. And uh, those of you who came to the previous lecture uh, would have heard my account of ugliness yeah, in Jagger's Bali. And today we're going to talk about precisely the opposite, beauty and grace. Yes, Bali as it should be. So <laughs> Jagger um, was famous for doing various things at the same time, yeah, and these contrasting things. So uh, by achieving this pinnacle of ugliness in the, in the dancing of the Rite of Spring, it doesn't mean that he abandoned the idea of classical ballet um, as, as something incredibly beautiful and graceful. And he would sometimes do these things side by side in the same season and in the same evening. Yeah, so that, that's the whole, the whole point. Uh, and uh, the theme today is playing with the past. Yeah? One thing that you uh, need to realize that in Diaghilev's troupe, all the dancers were always classically trained. He didn't just take anyone you know, from the outside who didn't know how to hold the posture and how to do the bar work. You know? So they had to do uh, this all the time. He still kept um, an Italian master, Cicchetti, who was uh, training them every, every day, more or less. And uh, so they were still able to perform these very difficult virtuosic classical um, uh, the tricks, yeah, uh, uh, as well as doing something incredibly modern, yeah, and subverting this um, uh, this classical virtuosity. Uh, so this very first picture that I have for you, it's a, a tapestry that featured in the very very first Diaghilev ballet, which was called La Pavilion d'Armide, yeah, so Armida's Pavilion. Uh, and this was done in 1909, and it was really the very beginning. So now, in the middle of our lecture course, I'm going to this very beginning again. Uh, the music was by Nikolai Cherypnin, who was a staff uh, conductor and composer of the Mariinsky Theater. And uh, he was an incredibly technical composer. He could do all kinds of things. He could write pastiche, and this music is mostly pastiche of Tchaikovsky. This is the closest that you get to Tchaikovsky. Uh, this ballet is transferred from the Mariinsky. Yeah? So it was 1907 in the Mariinsky, 1909 in Paris. The design was by Alexander Benoit. Uh, the plot was taken from a French source yeah, for, by Théophile Gautier um, from 1834. So that's already a yeah, 19th century plot. Um, the choreography was by Fokin. He was trying in this ballet again, uh, to reform classical choreography in various ways. Uh, and these are sort of wonderful uh, sets, uh, very elaborate sets that were done by Benoit for this. Uh, this is like a, a garden in Versailles, a formal garden, which was used as a back cloth. Uh, a few pictures here, yeah, elaborate costumes, uh, this is a, was a quite a small role danced by Nizhinsky, but he got photographed quite a lot. <laughs> and uh, in a very nice uh, way, you can now um, produce this effect with the computer when you can make a video out of the photograph. Yeah? So I'm going to show you a little, little moments with Nizhinsky of him moving, which are actually fake. Yeah, but I like them because it's like a miracle, because what happens in that story yeah, is that this uh, tapestry, this gobelin, it comes to life. Yeah, and uh, um, the traveler who stays in this mysterious pavilion falls in love with Armida and becomes her slave. And then the tapestry goes uh, inanimate again, but he notices that he still has his, his scarf. Yeah, so he's, he's now been enslaved. Yeah, so he just falls dead at the end. Uh, so anyway, um, and this ballet was basically uh, born out of the fascination of this whole world of art scene and Benoit and Diaghilev with three things. Yeah, with Versailles, this decadent culture of Versailles, with uh, E.T.A. Hoffmann, who was uh, the German writer who was writing these incredible, fantastic stories, supernatural stories, and with Tchaikovsky's Sleeping Beauty. Yeah, so it's a, as a production of 1890 with, with Petit Pas production. So these three things yeah, made them uh, come back to create a version, in a sense, of that 
a beautiful world. It's all done from one photograph. <laughs> Which I think is rather nice. Um, and this is Nishinsky and, and Pavlova. Yeah. you know, some of the choreography is lost, so we, we don't quite know what it was like, uh, but some of it uh, could be reconstructed. This is a modern version. This is the oriental dance in one of the registrants there. this very famous melody from this, which is just lovely, isn't it? So uh, these lovely things were already Fokin's Reforms Ballet. Yeah, th this wasn't the classical ballet, and it was uh, a, a great entertainment for, for the French. I'll, I'll just show another uh, moment where you have the apotheosis, the, the mass dancing, and the music here is very much like Tchaikovsky. <laughs> chap with a scarf, yeah? <laughs> uh, so one thing I wanted to point out musically, so I'm just going to p play a little bit of the music. It's not just Tchaikovsky, it's also a pastiche of Baroque music, yeah? So music also tries to go back to the past, to the past, maybe to the 18th century, maybe to the early 18th century, maybe even to the late 17th century. And uh, this, you will hear that the music is different. He is actually imitating Tchaikovsky again, but Tchaikovsky also wrote this pastiche music in his Serenade, serenade for Strings. So this is very close to the Serenade of string, for Strings, uh, and it's this very different style. compare it to Handel, for example. Yeah? So uh, this is a very important point that I'm going to make, that both music and choreography will start going 
back to the past, and sometimes not in parallel, at different times. And eventually, at the end of the lecture, they will come to more or less the same uh, place, yeah, the, into a creation, uh, to, to a creation of neoclassical style in both music and choreography. Uh, the next one I wanted to talk about, the next ballet is called Les Sylphides, and it's also uh, appeared in that very first season. And when looking at it now, you, you think, oh, this is a very classical ballet, because they all wear white, yeah, and they're all, <laughs> and it's almost an empty stage, they all wear white. Um, and, uh, but there was a term for that, it was called Ballet Blanc, yeah. Uh, the music is by Chopin. It was originally orchestrated by Glazunov back in 1893, then was reorchestrated partially for Diaghilev because Diaghilev always wanted to fiddle with music. <laughs> um, costumes were designed by Baxt uh, and based on this long tutu, uh, white tutu, which was worn by Maria Taglioni in the prototype for this ballet, which was called La Sylphide, yeah, so just one self as opposed to many selves. Yeah, so, and that was from uh, 1834, I think, maybe not 32, but 34. So, um, so it was a very conscious reference to the past of French ballet, yeah, because it was produced in Paris. So obviously, Diaghilev thought that he could please the French also by doing this. And, uh, it, visually, it seemed the same, but there was a very important difference. There was no narrative, yeah, because the original La Sylphide had a very complicated story. It was a full-length ballet. Here, it was just about dancing. There was no story at all. It was just Chopin, preludes and waltzes and mazurkas, just danced in groups in these beautiful patterns. So if you want, this is the first abstract ballet which actually doesn't have non-narrative, doesn't have a story. And compared to the classical poses, Fokin actually was trying to create more fluidity. And he was, you may, may remember that he was influenced by Isadora Duncan, yeah, who danced one of these pieces, a Chopin waltz in C-sharp minor, barefoot and these in very flowing clothes. Yeah, so in a sense, it's a kind of mixture, it's a kind of merging the classical style together with, with Duncan's style. And this is uh, the, the gist of uh, Fokin's reform. Uh, I wanted to quote uh, from what he wrote about it himself. Uh, because the ballet actually changed. At first, it, it had a lot of uh, narrative in it. You know, to start with, there was even Chopin himself appearing <laughs> in Mallorca. You know, there was actually a dancer to, made up to look like Chopin. You know, there were various Polish nobles da da dancing in costumes. It was a bit more story there. By the, Diag by the time it appeared in the Diaghilev production, there was no story at all. Uh, so. Uh, what um, Fokin said uh, about the pas de deux, uh, that waltz, yeah, that Isadora Duncan danced. The choreography differed from all other pas de deux in its total absence of spectacular feats. There was not a single entrechat, turn of the air, or pirouette. There was a slow turn of the ballerina holding her partner's hand, but this could not be classified as a pirouette because the movement was not confined to the turn, but was used for a change of position and grouping. When composing, I placed no restrictions on myself. I simply could not conceive of any spectacular stance to, to the accompaniment of the poetic, lyrical waltz of Chopin. I was totally unconcerned whether this romantic duet would bring applause or satisfy the audience or the ballerina, for I did not think of methods for guaranteeing success. Yes, he just wanted to do something beautiful, romantic, and not virtuosic. So this is a, a, a picture from the program, and uh, this is the set, and now we're going to hear a little bit of that waltz and its poetic choreography.
So uh, this ballet actually was in their repertoire until the very end. You know, they, they never abandoned it because it was always successful. And uh, at the premiere, it was Pavlova, yeah, or Pavlova, as, as you know her, uh, who danced this role. And uh, she got the best reviews because she also had this thinness. Yeah, it looked like she was flying on stage, that she was made of, I don't know. Uh, meringue, <laughs> um, yeah, which again was a kind of take on the original La Sylphide, which used these um, tricks, yeah, that they, they were actually flying on the ropes, yeah, so that was something that the Paris Ballet used to, to do. So th this didn't, didn't have any, any tricks like that, but she was just flying even without the need for any ropes, yeah, it's wonderful. So the next stage we are going to now talk about uh, the time just after World War I and about two ballets that in a very interesting way um, combined something very modern with something from the past. In this most, we, we very often talked about arts moving in parallel, yeah, like in the Rite of Spring. Everything seemed to kind of fit together. Yeah, or in Petrushka, everything seems to be in the same style. Here, on the contrary, you will have this dis dis disjointed, uh, yeah, just exposition of different styles. You will have, for example, cubist sets or like post-impressionist, very modern sets, and music which is classical. Yeah, so this suddenly musically, uh, Diaghilev gets fascinated with the going back into 19th century and then even into the 18th century and just using the music, original music written there, not even pastiche, just being reorchestrated by other composers. Yeah, so uh, one of the, the, the first um, incarnations of, of that idea is La Boutique Fantasque or the Magic Toy Shop from 1919. Uh, it's an interesting piece because it was a huge success in London. Uh, and uh, the music was by Rossini, yeah, so it's early 19th century, uh, orchestrated, yeah, put together by Respighi, Italian composer who was fascinated also with the past of Italian music. Uh, the choreographer was by Leonid Bassin, who was a new favorite of Jagelif at the time. Uh, and the uh, design yeah, was by André Durand and Picasso. Yeah, so you can see that it's a, it's a very different combination of things. Of things, uh, so if you uh, the, we don't actually not much is preserved from that choreography hasn't been preserved, but you can see the set. Yeah, the set is uh, is done in a very modern style, and the costumes are sort of also very different uh, from each other. Quite a lot of diversity. You can see this the same set. So the choreography is not original here, but uh, you can just get a, a sense of it because it's danced to the very famous Rossini Tarantella. Even more important is Pulcinella. That's next year, 1920. So uh, again, uh, it was actually Massin's idea to bring this play, uh, 18th century play, the idea of Commedia dell'arte, 18th century Italian genre, to the stage. Mm, he was fascinated about it. He studied it in the libraries. He was fascinated by the characters, which of course were stock characters. You probably know, like Pierrot, for example, yeah, or Arlequin, or Pulcinella, who was a, a, a character with a very big nose. Yeah, so, um, and the story is, a, is a just a simple story with various uh, adventures of uh, two couples yeah, who are in love with each other, but of course at, at some point start swapping, and then there's jealousy and murder and revival of Pulcinella, um, uh, who is brought back to life, a little bit like uh, something remi to remind us of Petrushka as well. Uh, so 
And the music, um, Dagelief was uh, adamant that he wanted the music by Pergolesi, and he found some manuscript you know, when, he, when he was in Italy. Some of them are not by Pergolesi. <laughs> yes, so some of them are by other composers from the same period. And he gave them all to Stravinsky to orchestrate. And he just thought he would use Stravinsky as a staff composer. Yeah, just orchestrate it. Don't do anything with it. Yeah? <laughs> so, of course, he was wrong. Yeah, because Stravinsky has done something to it. Yeah, so, first of all, he reduced the orchestra to just sort of the strings and, and small wind band. It wasn't a huge orchestra anymore. And then he started uh, mucking around with the harmony as well and with the orchestration, so putting in some grotesque effects, which are not actually that noticeable, you know, if you don't know the original. But people at the time were quite shocked by this and thought that he basically just, uh, you know, spoiled the, this wonderful, graceful 18th century music and that, the, that it was a horrible crime. Yeah, so he was accused of all kinds of things. Um, but uh, Diaghilev actually also was, uh, you know, offended by this at first and said, you can't do that, you know, this is wonderful, graceful music. He loved it for what it was. He didn't want Stravinsky interfering with it as well. But that was a wonderful moment when Stravinsky realized you can make uh, a whole new career phase out of this. He was an incredibly clever man. He sort of just felt that it was something that he could do next. And that began, became, uh, began the whole phase of his career, which was his neoclassical style. And so many people, many people just couldn't understand how he could do that after the rise of spring. Yeah, after reaching this absolute cutting edge of modernism, he suddenly takes these idioms from the 18th century. And even when he does something with them, you know, people like Prokofiev just couldn't understand, like, why? This is so old-fashioned. This is terrible. What is he doing? It's not his own. He's stealing this stuff, yeah? <laughs> All kinds of accusations. But, uh, you know, lots of musicians in French actually loved it and started imitating, imitating Stravinsky. And, uh, the interesting thing is that the public also loved this style much more than this, you know, out, uh, all out modernism, yeah, which is violent and aggressive and, you know, you have to sort of protect your ears. <laughs> and here, um, there was a little bit of play, yeah, but it was still rather pleasant, yeah, the distance was not as harsh. So neoclassical style also becomes a populist style. It's kind of acceptable face of modernism. If, if you like. So it all starts here. It all starts with Polchinella. So uh, now that has been reconstructed because, as you know, Massim lived a long life and uh, they managed to bring him in, and this is uh, the production that he um, supervised. So you can see uh, this uh, <laughs> very uh, interesting cubist set by Picasso. Um, again, you know, Picasso tried lots of various different things that Diaghilev didn't like, just said, no, this is not what I want. And the moment he came up with that, he said, yes, this is what I want, a Neapolitan street, but in a Cubist way. And to go with that, he had this lovely 18th century music.
Actually, the most grotesque moment in Stravinsky's score, where you have a solo from the double basses, yeah, who always play a little bit out of tune, yeah, and these sounds that you would not expect of Pergolesi at all, yeah. So, but it's very, very subtle still, you know, compared to other things that he had done. So uh, now, uh, what we are going to look at is one terrible misfortune, disaster, catastrophe. Um, when Diaghilev was trying to actually put a classical ballet without changing very much. And it was the only full length, whole night narrative ballet that he did. And he did it for one reason, because he loved it. That was the inspiration of his whole life. Yeah? Uh, it was the Sleeping Beauty by Tchaikovsky, which in his production was called Sleeping Princess. So that happened in 1921, and it was in London, it was in Leicester Square, it was in the Alhambra Theatre, uh, which I think I have here, which is no more. <laughs> We've lost that, I think. Um, something is, this there is not quite as <laughs> attractive. Um, but anyway, so it was full length, it was Tchaikovsky's music, again, only partially reorchestrated by Stravinsky, sets, uh, sets and costumes by Leon Bakst. Um, original choreography just a little bit touched up with some additional dances by Bronislava Nizhinska. Uh, and the interesting thing is that he wanted this ballet to run forever. He, was, uh, he had this idea, there was some comedy show that ran for four years in London and earned a huge amount of money. And he was, why can't I do this? Yeah? Let me try this. So he really wanted to run this ballet every night and some matinees as well, you know, two matinees a week. The problem is that his troupe was quite small. Yeah? He wouldn't be able to, one, the same ballerina could not do this, this prima donna dance, uh, prima ballerina dance every night. It's impossible to do. So he would need at least three possibly and even four. And where would he ha get all these dancers? He would be schooled to such an extent that they were able to perform this. So here, one thing happened, of course, which was the Russian Revolution, and there were more and more emigres coming out of the now Soviet Russia to the West. And he managed to engage, he found this amazing dancer, Olga Spisivtseva, uh, who was uh, living in a garret somewhere, you know, poor. She wasn't dancing at the time. He found her, brought her to Paris, and she became the star of the show. The only problem was her name, Spisivtseva, which, of course, you know, English people could not possibly uh, pronounce or conceive of. So he, Jagilev changed it to Spisiva, <laughs> so just to shorten it. Uh, and also to uh, further, uh, yes, he still needed more of the, these dancers. Another prima ballerina that he found was 46 years of age, and she hadn't danced for 10 years because she was married to some rich person you know, and who then died. Uh, so she didn't have to dance, and then suddenly you know, she, uh, he, he engaged her, and apparently there are wonderful anecdotes about this production. Uh, apparently, um, she was learning, relearning, you know, trying to be on form, relearning all the, the technique, technical stuff in the uh, room in the Savoy, yeah? uh, using her, her bed as the bar. And uh, before the, the, the first night, she wrote them, Dagilev, this letter, oh, please release me from my contract, otherwise I'm going to commit suicide. I'm not on form, I can't dance anymore. And he just ignored it. <laughs> and she was fabulous. Yeah, so she was fabulous, and immediately there were clans of people who uh, one supported Spisivtseva and another one supported, supported her. Trifilova was her name. Uh, he also had to engage some English dancers because he did, simply didn't have enough. And this is uh, something that I love, that they actually took uh, Russian names 
<laughs> I, I think it's a lovely thing, you know, we Russians have very so little sometimes to be proud of on the international stage, but this is the moment. <laughs> this is the moment, you know, one is defeating Napoleon, uh, but another one, you know, another one is, uh, is that somebody who was called Patrick K <laughs> became Patrick Kiev, which is actually <laughs> a real Russian name. I think that was a really, uh, really funny, uh, funny thing. So uh, the costumes were, were amazing. This is, I mean, why it became a financial disaster, because the costumes were incredibly expensive. Um, it was uh, as expensive a production as nothing before. Um, incredibly elaborate things. Um, I just wanted to show you Spisivtsova, uh, who was incredibly beautiful. Uh, and Nijinska uh, also da da danced the, uh, the main part only once. Uh, she wasn't found to be beautiful enough. Yeah, so she, she danced the hummingbird princess <laughs> uh, in other. This is the original of the 1890 uh, production. Yeah, this is how grand it looked. And this is really the only thing that I can show you because the, the choreography was more or less the same. I actually. Uh, had just, you know, maybe a few months ago, uh, was in St. Petersburg and saw it, a reconstruction which was done as faithfully as possible of this 1890 production. And it's an amazing show, incredible. So just a little bit, a, a taste of it. more and more people come, you know, they're all wearing different costumes. Some of the costumes that Bach designed were too heavy for them to, to wear, and so they couldn't jump quite as high. Yeah, so Dagelief just went, came with scissors and just got them shorter. And apparently the tailor cried, you know, was in tears. <laughs> this just shows you again, you know, to remind you how Dagelief yeah, got into every single detail of the thing. But uh, disaster struck actually on the first night because the, the beautiful sets where, where you had the transformation of one set into another didn't work. The machinery didn't work. It was all a mess and it sort of got stuck. So they actually had to play Tchaikovsky's Fifth Symphony <laughs> while, you know, this 40 minute delay. You imagine, yes, it was a complete nightmare. Uh, and and Diaghilev was livid, he cried, and, uh, and he thought it was a bad omen, uh, and it was. Uh, so, you know, some of the reviews were actually very good, because <laughs> you can see this is, I think, from the Times. Um, uh, I'm glad to see in chaste mood, yeah, the Russian Valley have returned. The weird and wild has been abandoned in favor of the classics. And an uncommonly fine classic it is. Yes, some people actually were relieved that they didn't have to look at this weirdness and they had something normal to see. Yeah, but uh, other people uh, <laughs> reacted like this. The whole thing is so degraded, especially the music. Yeah, it, you might find it funny, but actually it was very difficult to sell Tchaikovsky to, to the English for many, many decades. I've, I've read lots of reviews and they're absolutely awful, racist and... <laughs> <laughs> and just, just terrible. Yeah. So somehow, you know, Tchaikovsky's music was was seen so uncool. Yeah. So incredibly sentimental. Um, I don't think it, it, the same thing happens now. Yeah. I think you've, you've got over it. Yeah. But at the time, <laughs> at the time, it really was it was a problem. And Diaghilev really loved Tchaikovsky, as I, as I told you. And Stravinsky loved Tchaikovsky. So they both were finding trying to find a way to sell it to the public, and they failed. And uh, so gradually, uh, you know, after a few weeks, uh, they, they couldn't fill the hole anymore. And they were trying to think of various ridiculous things to how to bring the public back. Um, one of the ideas was that there should be a, a two 
two ballet dancers should be engaged in comedy dialogue in between the numbers. And the dialogue should be written by George Bernard Shaw. <laughs> that is one of the ideas. Yeah, another idea was that there should be live animals. Yeah, so there, there were live animals for one night, but of course that, that never worked. So the, they scrapped that. Another idea was that there should be sort of almost naked figurehead of the ship who was a, a, a real ballerina as well. Yeah, so that, you know, all kinds of things, but nothing worked. And uh, it, was, it was a disaster, it was terrible death for Diaghilev, and his company was banned from performing in London for three years. <laughs> so um, so that, that didn't work very well. So uh, now we, we're going on to 1923, so two years later, he's recovered from that. Uh, and this is a very interesting ballet um, uh, to consider, because this is Stravinsky's ballet that he started writing immediately after the Rite of Spring, 1913. Yes, this is the, the next thing. But it only gets to the stage in 1923, 10 years later. Ten, uh, so 10 years later, and during that time, of course, we had the war and all kinds of delays for various reasons. He finished the score in short score in 1915 already. And then he was thinking of how to orchestrate it. So he actually went through several different versions. And it's very interesting aesthetically to see how these versions are different. Yeah, so uh, the first one was supposed to be for a big orchestra, just like the Rite of Spring. Yes, same thing. And Natalia Gonchirova, who was already commissioned at that point in 1915 to start designing costumes and sets, also started with a similar idea of very bright colors, yeah, great uh, sort of folk patterns, peasant patterns, and things like that. And then gradually both of them moved in a very different direction. Stravinsky, uh, for example, um, created an interim version, which we know now as an interim version, which had very strange things in it. It had cymbalons, uh, which were supposed to be specially made so that you can play on them like a piano, and it had a pianola as well. Yeah, pianola is a mechanical piano. So Stravinsky was fascinated by this idea of you know, mechanical sound, of machinery making music, like a music box. Yeah, so, so that's an interesting thing. We're, we're going to hear just a little bit of it. Uh, and uh, you will see what's, what these different uh, versions look at in the end. But uh, before going there, I will just say that the libretto was compiled by uh, Stravinsky himself from various folk sources, and it's very difficult to understand, even in Russian, yeah, because it's just folk verses. They're very often superimposed on each other. Uh, sometimes a male is singing what should really belong to a female, and the other way around. Yeah, the, the, the characters that are named don't seem to be the real characters. It's, it's abstracted bits of text. Yeah, which are just put together in this modernist collage. Yeah, so folk sources, but messed up. Yeah, and uh, the same thing happens in the music, as you will see. So um, this is the version with Symbolom. You will not hear it very well. It's, <laughs> it's a rehearsal of it. But you will just see it. Yes, I just want you to see it, that it actually exists. <laughs> Almost, yeah, you can hear him playing. Um, so um, I wanted to give you a few quotes from uh, Goncharova because it's very interesting how her aesthetic changed during that time. So at, the f at first, yeah, he says, at that time it was the festive folk aspect of weddings that stood out for me. The colorful costumes and dances that connect weddings with holidays, enjoyment, abundance, and happy vitality. Therefore, the costumes I designed were derived from peasant forms and vivid colors, harmonized sometimes in unison, sometimes by opposites, almost without intermediates, and this applied to decorations and curtains as well. Uh, 
And uh, often when I worked, I remember the great village wedding festival, which I attended while still a child. There were too many guests at this bar, and they were crowded around the large table. The first row seated, the others standing, wiping their large faces with embroidered towels. They were all shouting, eating, and the bubble drinking. I can still see this picture. I always also thought of the days when the air was buzzing with bees, scented with honey. It's just beautiful prose, isn't it? Ripe strawberries and newly cut hay. And this kind of idealized picture of the Russian villages. And that they all were dressed in their best clothes and gay prints and beautiful hand-woven materials. Um, scarves of all colors. And at the end, gradually, especially after hearing Stravinsky's music, she arrives uh, to something else entirely, to something that is devoid of pattern, that is basically black and white, although it's not quite black and white, it's brown and, and, and cream, so to speak, or brown and white. Brown being the color of the earth. And uh, she says that she went through thinking and remembering other things, other weddings, when people who were marrying weren't actually in love, and sometimes uh, the boy was uh, so much younger, it hasn't hit puberty yet, much smaller than his wife. Yeah, there were arranged marriages, uh, in, uh, arranged peasant weddings, which didn't have this joyful atmosphere at all, and instead of that there was the air of solemnity and stiffness, and uh, so he, she started thinking of this kind of thing. So, uh, so this is, you know, her thinking changed. Pattern might perhaps have accorded better with the expressively complicated rhythm of the music, but only against the uniformly plain background for all the costumes. However, I would have assumed so much importance, it would have assumed so much importance that it would have cancelled out the line of the movements completely and would have destroyed all the solemn meaning of the rite. I decided that the costumes might be uniform in tone. Yeah, so now you have just these black and brown things all dressed the same, moving on stage, and essentially the, what you arrive at is something like les sylphides, yeah, so patterns, yeah, patterns and groupings, uh, which is a kind of neoclassical ballet. Yeah, being born suddenly of this, of a Russian ballet, which shouldn't really be, ha, have any connection to classical style at all. And uh, this is uh, the thinking yeah, behind the, these new colors. They must wear the color of innocence white uh, yeah, or you know, brown as the color of the earth. Mm, uh, the men had white shirts and brown trousers, and the girls white blouses and brown skirts, based on Russian peasant wear. They actually used the rehearsal clothes <laughs> as the basis for that. Yeah, so it was as, as simple as possible. And there are a few ideas that are very important for, for this production. Yeah, the idea of impersonality of the ritual. We already talked about it in the Rite of Spring, yeah, the fact that you're not supposed to be involved, and even... Uh, the, the one who is sacrificed yeah, is kind of just submits uh, to, to the ritual. And in the same way here, you see the bride and groom and they're standing and not moving and being kind of completely non-expressive. Uh, Gonchirova uh, uh, compared the choreography to figures on Greek vases. And uh, I think Nizhinska, who did the choreography, compa compared them to the saints from Russian icons because they have these elongated figures. And why are they uh, elongated? Because they dance on point. Yeah? And it's, it, it was very surprising. And, uh, and Diaghilev just loved this idea. So suddenly dancing on point in the Russian ballet, Russian folk ballet, yeah, based on authentic folk, folk sources, makes no sense. You would think, makes no sense. Goes against everything that had been done. Remember the, the pigeon toes and the right of spring. Yeah, so the opposite. Now, it's the opposite again. Yeah? You, you're going back on point, but as a new expressive device, as a new expressive use of this technique. And uh, you will see it in a moment, and I'll just one, mention one more point about the music, that Stravinsky was also fascinated by the idea of writing music that wasn't expressive. Yeah, he actually said, music does not express anything at all. That was a very famous quote of his. Yeah, and it was thinking of music of architecture of, as pattern rather than expression of feeling. But, you know, you can judge uh, to what extent he's actually telling the truth. Um, 
Now, the music was criticized, still, despite this rather different coloring, uh, because now uh, you had, the, the, in, the, in the last version, it, he arrived at the idea of four pianos and two groups of percussion and singers. Yeah, so it wasn't an orchestra at all. And it was a very kind of bell-like sound. Yeah, because imagine four pianos, they all strike together, and together with tubular bells as well. And it's almost like bell, bells, you know, Christian bells that celebrate the wedding. But nevertheless, the criticism was like a new bizarre effects whose strident and discordant accents not only faint or charmed the ear, but by the repetition even provoke it uh, into a state of rebellion. I could hear noise, nothing but noise. Where was the music secreted in all this pandemonium? Yeah, so uh, there was. This, are the, this is the evolution yeah, of, the con of the costume, starting from left to right. You can see that it's first yeah, very loud, incredibly loud folk style. Then it becomes uh, much more uh, muted. Yeah, you still have a little bit of pattern, and then finally you arrived at this, this very graceful and monochrome palette. Um, the part of the ritual at the very beginning is um, when the bride's hair is being combed. Yeah, so she used to have one braid, and now it will be two. So part of the ritual is her, her girlfriends are yeah, combing it. And uh, Diaghilev sort of imagined that she would be sitting and uh, they would be combing. And Gintirova said, uh, so Gintirova, uh, Nizhinska, yeah, the choreographer said, no, no, that, that there won't be any chair, there won't be any combing. The dancers will represent the comb and the movement of the combing. And we'll see, see how that's done. <laughs> So you can see they have their sharp toes, yeah? that we are familiar with, yeah, but very, very kind of authentic present singing, which is put in, uh, you know, surrounded by very modernist harmony, and kind of very often fragmented with very superimpositions later on. And, uh, and in the choreography, yeah, you have both uh, folk gestures like this one. So almost, yeah, referring to the Rite of Spring, there's something like that in there. But uh, it's all in beautiful symmetrical patterns. Yes, symmetry once again, the opposite of the right of spring, where everything was asymmetrical. Now symmetry once again. It's almost like, yeah, les sylphides again, but only in slightly folk style. So it's a very interesting combination of elements. Uh, just show you a, a very famous uh, moment there of creating this abstract pattern. <laughs> Yeah, but that's also symbolic. Yeah, so the choreography actually is symbolic. Uh, show you a more uh, sort of raucous moment from the final tableau. Well, lots of things are superimposed. <laughs>
has these very simple patterns which could almost be sung in the village, yeah, but placed in this very percussive con context, very machine-like almost, yeah, very modern. And the sound is almost like devoid yeah, of strings or, or wind instruments. Yeah? It's all very percussive and very rhythmical. Uh, the final moment, just the bells at the end, also a very beautiful apotheosis. Wonderful apotheosis. Yeah, not noise at all, you would say. Yeah, but still wasn't necessarily heard as as something pleasant at the time. So, a wonderful great ballet, and it's been preserved to us uh, in more or less authentic ways. So you can go and, and watch it. I think it's one of the things that that you should do because it's it's just so wonderful. And the final one, and finally we get to the moment where neoclassical music and neoclassical choreography, choreography come together. Um, and that's Apollon Musaget, Apollo, Apollo leader of the muses uh, from 1928. It's another ballet by Stravinsky. And the interesting thing that it was actually an American commission uh, from the Library of Congress. And uh, there was some obviously scandal with Diaghilev who couldn't understand how Stravinsky could write a ballet for somebody else, but Stravinsky secured the rights for Diaghilev as well. So a few weeks later after the premiere, it was done in Paris in 1928 and it was a huge success. And this, uh, the choreographer here was the, the new uh, the protege of Diaghilev and it was uh, George Balanchine yeah, or Balanchivadze as he used to be before he came to Paris, yeah, a Georgian dancer and uh, also a choreographer. So, uh, only four characters here, the god Apollo and three muses, yeah, Terpsichore for dance and song, polyhymnia, uh, mime and Calliope poetry. Yeah? And all of these, I think, are there, three of them, not nine, uh, to represent various aspects of ballet itself. Yeah? Because the story is really minimal. It starts from the birth of Apollo, then Apollo gives the muses all the various objects, uh, you know, according to what they, they do, what their job is, and then they ascend to Parnassus, uh, the Mount Parnassus at the end, and nothing else happens. It's all about dance. So it seems that the ballet is about the genre of ballet in, in many ways. Uh, so Stravinsky's music is really the pinnacle of this neoclassical style and Balanchine always said, I imagine it as completely white, or white on white. It's very restrained, it's very beautiful, it's not actually that dissonance. Um, there is a, a Diaghilev's description um, of music after he just heard the first half of it played by Stravinsky. It is, of course, an amazing work, extraordinarily calm and with a greater clarity than anything he has done so far. A filigree counterpoint of transparent, clear-cut ideas, all in the major key. Somehow music, not of this world, but from somewhere above. It seems strange that though the tempo of all this part is slow, yet at the same time it's perfectly adapted to dancing. And this is what Stravinsky said uh, about one, uh, or you know, about his ballet. He said lots of different things, and it's actually extremely pretentious in the way he describes it. All the things it's supposed to refer to. It's like a, a whole encyclopedia of, of Western culture, just thrown together into one ballet. So he says, the real subject of Apollo is versification which implies something arbitrary and artificial to most people, though to me, art is arbitrary and must be artificial. The, base, the basic rhythm patterns are iambic. The rhythm of the cello solo with the pizzicato accompaniment is a Russian Alexandrine, suggested to me by a couplet from Pushkin. The remainder of the Calliope variation as a musical exposition of the Boileau text that I took as my motto, and he gives you the French, yeah, qu'est toujours dans vos vers, le sens coupant des mots, and the suspens de le mystiche marque le repos. So you will just hear this 
uh, up. And I try to, to read it as it's going to be sounded. Choreography, which you've just seen, yeah, is really the invention of neoclassical style in, in, in dance. Uh, as you could see, it's another ballet blanc, and elements of classical ballet are reconceived, recontextualized, fragmented, uh, the geometrical lines. Sometimes, you know, the fluidity is on, on, on deliberately uh, disrupted. Yeah? So uh, it's all like Stravinsky's music. There's some, some, something alien about it. You cannot confuse it with something fr from the 18th century. Yes, Stravinsky's music is different. Even though it sounds quite harmonious, it's, there's something wrong about it. And the same thing goes for the choreography. Uh, and the costumes and sets were just by somebody who was uh, not even particularly good. Yeah, they, they wanted them to be a bit tawdry because the ballet is usually associated with the slightly uh, slightly weird sets, you know, and not, 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 it, it's the ballet as it was before Diaghilev in a sense, yeah. Um, very conventional costumes and very conventional sets. Um, I'll just show you a little bit more, actually, to cut, to cut it, I'll go to the next one. classical poses, as you can see. Beautiful, lots of classical poses, and they're all taken out of context. Uh, and uh, I wanted to show you the, the very ending of it, the apotheosis, where uh, Apollo and three muses, three muses are almost like horses. Yeah, the, the, usually Apollo is pictured with, the, with four horses, yeah, uh, uh, drawing, draw, uh, drawing him. And uh, this is what happens here. cut off a little bit, it's a beautiful ending. And uh, the question is, you know, is this apotheosis, this quiet apotheosis, a very lyrical one, 
Is it inexpressive? Does it actually have feeling? Yeah, this is a big question. So sometimes we might suspect that Stravinsky wasn't quite telling the truth when he said that he wanted the music to be non-expressive. But this lyrical ending certainly had a great um, you know, continuation, a great effect on people who didn't actually expect anything like that. So uh, just to summarize today's lecture, so you could see that uh, Diaghilev never allowed his dancers to lose their schooling. Yeah, so the classicism is always available to them. And uh, at various points, uh, there were very interesting, various interesting combination of classical styles or classical elements, both in music and in choreography, um, which uh, might have been mismatched or sometimes they were uh, altered in, in various ways. But in the end, uh, the fact that around 1920, musical neoclassicism really took off uh, it spurred choreography to develop in, in this parallel way. And in Balanchine and Stravinsky doing Apollo in 1928, it's really the marvelous moment in ballet where the two come together, create something new, a very new kind of beauty, a new kind of grace, which was incredibly modern and provocative when you think of that. But at the same time, yeah, it was the apotheosis of beauty. And so many people after that imitated that particular ballet. It really started uh, a new, uh, the ballet in a new direction. Uh, and of course, um, very sadly, next year after that, Diaghilev would die. And so this is, comes right at the end of the Diaghilev period, uh, almost at the very end, as some kind of new beginning, which never found a continuation within the ballerias. Thank you very much.